Hello, today is March 29th, 2007. My name is Amy Laity, and we are at the Genoa Branch Library in Genoa, Ohio. And as part of the library's participation in the Oral History Project Northwest Ohio Narratives, I'm going to be talking to Mr. Lamar Bauer about growing up in Genoa. We're talking to Mr. Lamar Bauer, and may we videotape this yes, conversation? You may. Yes, you may. Um, I understand you've um, lived in Genoa your entire life. Not quite. I was okay. born in Fremont, Ohio, okay. but I moved here as like one year old or so with my mom and dad, mm -hmm. and we lived on uh, about nine. 14 or so Main Street at that particular time. And then in 1926, my mom and dad built a new home on 10th Street. And that's where I grew up at then, as I remember. Is that house still there? Yes. If you, uh, well, let's see, who could I refer to that you may know? Are you from Genoa? No, I'm not. <laughs> well, well, you know, 10th Street. Yes. And you go east on 10th, and it'd be the, after you cross Washington, to be the second house on the left. It's a red brick home. <clears throat> That's where I grew up at till I left for the service military. Okay. Well, let's <clears throat> talk about your childhood in Genoa. Could you walk, did you call it uptown or downtown? Yeah, uptown. Uptown. Yeah. And could you walk there? Oh, yeah. As I got older, when we were kids, no, wasn't permitted up there. The first I can really remember is probably eight, nine, ten years old. That's the earliest I've been recollecting back, and that's about the first I can remember anything positive about our childhood. The first thing that comes to mind is the old blacksmith shop, which was right next door to the south where we lived. So that was at 10th Street? No, the oh. Blackman shop was on Main Street. On Main Street. Right next to the home that we lived in at, I think, 914 or so Main Street. It was to the south of that particular house. And the fellow by name of Dave Jensen owned it and was a proprietor. They shooed the horses put the steel tires on the old wooden wheels for the wagons. And then out and back, I can remember they had a huge uh, round cylinder of water, probably a foot or so deep, where when they would put the steel tires on the wooden wheels, they would take that out there then and, and submerse it in the water to shrink up the iron to make a good steady a good hard uh, clamp around the wheel and also saturate the wood so it wouldn't catch on fire from the hot hot iron. But my friend and I, <coughs> excuse me, friend and I spent a lot of time over there watching him work at the his uh, forging place, I guess you would call it. So there still were some horses. Well, then, yes. In town. Mm -hmm. Then. Yeah, that in fact that blacksmith shop was there. I think yeah, when I was in high school, and I graduated in May of 1941. So it had a long, long life. What were some of the other businesses that were downtown? Well, as I recall, let's see, Henry Bergman, who happened to be. Our neighbors, uh, when we moved into the new home, he had a cement block factory over by the swimming quarry now, and they manufactured cement blocks. They made them one at a time, and then they would uh, put them on a little flat car that they pushed by hand on a rail, like a railroad, only a much narrower gauge, and then they would take them out and stack them in piles out in the yard there where we swam, and they had hundreds and hundreds of them stacked there to cure, to dry out and cure and wait, waiting to be used. He was uh, also a road contractor, which his son Eldo then followed him up after 
elder was able to take over. And he had his uh, repair shop for his trucks where the present post office is. That was a garage in there, and he stored his trucks there and his road maintainers, graders, uh, you name it, that's where he stored it at and repaired it in that same area. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, I've seen some references to um, the Bauer Sox building. Where Do I, you happen to know? No, no, I can't help you there. How no. about the Utah building? No, no, okay. don't know that one either. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, what other kinds of businesses were there? Was there uh, five and ten? or? Well, later, yes, there was, as I recall. Uh, I would say about 1938 along in there, in that era, uh, Mrs. Gallup had a five and ten or general dime store, I guess, as they would call it then. And her husband also delivered ice to the people in the area that didn't have refrigerators at that time. They'd take ice in the summer. And he, he delivered the ice from a little ice shack out in the back of that property where the five and 10 cent store sat. And in the winter time, he would saw ice out of the present swimming quarry for his use to sell. And they'd get a lot, a lot of ice there. And then he had a fellow by the name of Mouse Beck, who was a local young man. And, and they lived over here on Superior Street, I think, just back of the library to the west of this place. And he would deliver the ice for this Mr. Gallup. And he had that job for many, many years. And he was a great Cleveland Indian baseball mm -hmm. fan. And he had a mind like you wouldn't believe. In encyclopedia, he could remember everything. I remember all those statistics. Yeah. And at that time, I was a, still am a Cleveland baseball fan. So he and I got to know each other pretty well when we were, I was young and he was maybe 40 at the time, and I thought he was really old. <laughs> How that goes. <laughs> well, let's see, what else was there? There was some uh, fellow by the name of Mac McClargan. He had a restaurant where the Bull and Law Office is today. That was a small restaurant. And I think, let's see now. It's a hardware store? Yeah, I had two hardware stores uh, where the stores, well, the buildings are still there, but they're now the senior citizens' uh, buildings where they meet at and social room. One was a Hesser hardware and the other one was a Skilder hardware. And they were side by side. And if you needed a couple nails or you're building something, you go into one of them and buy a couple nails or whatever you needed. Very, very handy at that time. And the, I know there are two banks in town. Were there two banks then? Or? Yeah, there, well, one was Genoa Bank, banking, and mm -hmm. the other one was Genoa Savings and Loan. That's what I remember anyway. Now, my dad, about oh, a good 10 years ago, he made a tape like we're making now telling about these banks and when the one of them got robbed and what the activity was about the shooting and everything. So if you would need that, I could possibly get that and you could... Well, why don't it. you tell us the story as you heard it? Well, it was where the uh, savings and loan was. The buildings still are there on Main Street, on the east side of Main Street. And there was a robbery on mid-afternoon. And at that time, there were still trees along both sides of the main street. And the robbers come out of the robbing the Genoa Savings and Loan. And the bullets were flying and people were ducking behind the trees to get out of the way. And I guess the robbers did get away with any money they got. 
but he goes into quite elaborate detail of it. And it's been several years since I've heard this tape, but I'd be willing to let you have it if you want to make a copy of it, which would add more insight to the early days of downtown Genoa. Maybe we'll do that. Somebody was killed in that robbery. Oh, was there? Was I don't recall that. I don't. Okay, well, we'll check that. Okay. <laughs> When you wa went up downtown with your buddies, where, what stores did you like to go to? Or where did you like to hang out? Wasn't any place we could <laughs> hang out. <laughs> well, my good buddy, George Harlow Roods, call him Huck now, uh, <clears throat> his dad had the Ford dealership in Genoa. And that is, was located where the present walkthrough now is between uh, the drugstore and the uh, pottery shop. It's now got a gazebo there and a parking area out back. That was where the garage was. And he and I hung around together a lot, and we'd spend a lot of time up there at the garage. And George had a paper out and delivered the Newsby papers. It was printed in Toledo. It was a competition to the Toledo Blade. And... <clears throat> Of course, the town was about the same size as it is today, back then. This would be about 1938. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we'd take a car. George could drive, and I'd rode with him, and he'd drive the route, and I'd deliver the papers from the car up to the house. <laughs> Five days a week, they didn't have a Saturday paper on the newsbeat. The Blade took over then for the Saturday and Sunday route. So every day after school, we deliver those papers. That's about where we hung out at. And then as we grew older, we were allowed to go into the pool room, which was Rice's pool room. Uh, there's sheer delights in that particular building right now. And that's where we learned to play pool at, which is, uh, to me, is a great uh, hobby to have. Was... Um George's father's car dealership, was that the first car dealership in Genoa? As uh, far as I know, he, he had Ford and he also had uh, Willie's Knight. That was the forerunner of the Jeep people in Toledo. Uh, and he also sold a, a Lincoln Zephyr, which was made by the Ford Motor Company. And this, to my knowledge, that was the first one I knew of, yes. So was downtown Genoa a pretty busy place on Saturday night? Oh, yes, Friday and Saturday night. As as we got a little older, let's see, 36, 37, 38, and maybe a year or so later, every Friday and possibly Saturday night, there was an outdoor movie made. And uh, the movies were shown sometimes there, uh, where the Berman Furniture Store was. I think that's uh, 6th Street, I believe. Isn't this 6th Street right out here? Yes. So that would be at 6th and Main. Yeah, be, uh, east, it was on 6th Street, east of Main Street. They'd put up a screen, a big screen, and then you brought your own chairs or maybe they provided planks or something to set on. And they would show the pictures there. And then they went uh, behind the present town hall where the jail was because there was no windows in the jail and they put the screen up against there and showed the movies there. And then later they come over here behind Sigler and Seaving and put a screen up against the old Hester Hardware building and showed the movies up against there. But I do remember it there they put cement block up and then like a two by eight plank over the block and that's where your seats. And they always run a special, or a serial I should say, an ongoing, every week they'd have a new chapter on it and you follow that and I remember, and my wife would vouch for this, I think it was called The Lost City. And it was very spooky at that time for us. <laughs> Did you ever... See the final chapter of the Probably, I don't remember it was the final, but we didn't miss many of them. Then if you had a quarter in your pocket, why, 
You could go to the A&P and get a small sack of uh, caramel kisses, and they had a little peanut butter in them. And they were delicious. You paid a nickel for that, and that's that lasts you all night. Then there was another place, John C. Colley. He was a he served ice cream, sodas, sundaes, ice cream cones, and then he also had what they called at that time penny candy. Everything was a penny. You paid a penny for well, a big sucker, or you paid a penny. Maybe you got two jawbreakers, two uh, like uh, graham crackers in a ball coated with chocolate. And I guess that's it. Well, he had other things to, uh, to sell, but nobody smoked then. We didn't have any money to buy anything anyway. That was... Uh, so you always About look for good weather on a Friday oh, or Saturday. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's for sure, and or Saturday. Mm -hmm. I think it moved back and forth. Uh, one week they'd maybe have it on Friday, the following week they'd have it on a Saturday. And that brought a lot of people into Genoa, and that was what it was for, to generate interest downtown here, get the people up here to patronize the local people. Was that put on by an organization like the Chamber of Commerce, or was it a uh, just uh, a, a business? Just a businesses, business, I business. think. And yeah. you know, there used to be quite a few in Genoa. There was see uh, uh, Al Camper. He had a grocery store and a meat market combined, and then there was uh, Cashin's Market, which was also a grocery store and a meat market combined. Uh, Hesselbart's, which was the red and white store, what they called it, they had a just a grocery store, and then right along next to them was a fellow by the name of, I think it was Bill Herman, I think, and he lived in the house that the upholstery shop has now across on the east side of Main Street where the Bergman family lived, okay. and he was the meat cutter. So you could go to Hesselbarts and get your groceries and to uh, Bill Herman's shop to get your meats. And then uh, the AMP, they just had lunch meats, I think. They didn't have any, like, steak or pork chops or hamburger, anything like that. But they did have groceries and a small lunch meat counter. That's about all the grocery stores, which was had in... See, Cashins and Hesselbarts and Campers all had home delivery. You could call on your crank-up telephone, and you could give them your order, what you wanted, and maybe an hour or so, there would come, which would really be nice today for people. A lot of them uh, unable to drive. And a lot of older women are left all alone. Their husbands passed away, and they have no way, way to get uptown unless their kids can come and take them somewhere. But if this home delivery was still in effect, that would be a big advantage for them. Were there any restaurants uptown? Just this one I mentioned, uh, oh. McClargan, mm -hmm. as far as I remember. And they always had a couple bars. Dunn's Bar was there forever, as I remember. And then Blasey's, which is still a bar and a restaurant. Of course, uh, Dunn's has changed hands several times, and the more it changes hands, the more food they handle, mm -hmm. besides their uh, so beer license. And what, um, what's at the present-day site of Dunn's Bar? Right where it is today. Um, what's the business? Now? Yes. Uh, call it Ray and Jets. Ray and Jets. Yeah. And at the other one? McClargan? Yes. Exactly. Okay, that's where the um, Bolin Law Office is okay. now. Yeah. Did any of the restaurants have a specialty, like that people mm -hmm. would travel? Not that I remember, no. Yeah. Of course, then Felbingers came along. That's where it just changed hands again. I, I, my wife said it's called the R Restaurant, I think. R Cafe. And uh, that was built after World War II, shortly after that. And then Mr. Felbinger and his wife started that. And then it changed hands a couple of times. 
It was TT Tops and it was a, I don't know, some, some outfit out of Waterville owned it for a year or two. Does downtown, do the buildings look much different? Well, right today they look different because all of them are uh, painted the, your, their fronts and put awnings up and replaced some windows that needed badly. But basically it's, uh, the building's about the only one missing is the one where Mr. Rude's had his Ford dealership at. That was torn down several years ago. But the rest of them are all, all about the same. Some have moved, of course. But the original buildings, to my knowledge, are still there. Did you ever visit the library in the town hall? Oh, yes. Okay. And the reason, and when they first moved there, I had, had just graduated from high school. This was in May 25th of 1941. I graduated from Genoa High School. And somehow or another, they give me the job of making their first sign, <laughs> Genoa Library, <laughs> with hours on it, I suppose, and I guess I got five bucks or so to, to make that. And then I had somebody help me. They had a hanger that they wanted to put up in the boulevard between the sidewalk and the street, and they had a post there that was, oh, maybe eight, ten foot high, and a couple other people helped me put it up there, but it was there for a good many years. Can you describe what the library was like? Well, as I recall, it was, uh, let's see now, you come in off the 6th Street entrance door, which nowadays you put you into the council chambers. And then when they first built it, it was put back to the, be the southwest corner of the, of the building in a small room back there. And they just had shelves maybe five, six foot high that they stored their books on. That's the way I remember it. That was way back in 1941. You don't happen to know where the Grange used to meet, did you, before they moved to this building over no, there? No, I don't. I'm just no. trying to find that out. <laughs> Can't find that either. <laughs> what were the Depression years like in Genoa? Well, very poor. I had no, nobody had very much money. And we'd try to do anything we could to earn a dime or a quarter. Or, and I uh, had a job for a lady, her name was Mrs. Clark. She lived on a corner of uh, 10th and Main on the northeast corner there, and the house is still there. She had one son, her name was, his name was Bill Clark, and he worked for the savings and loan later then, and he retired from there. But uh, my friend George Roots and I, we go over there and she'd always give us crackers. So when we were just young and I got the job of mowing her grass. And then in the springtime, like now, you'd have to dig up all the flower beds and loosen up all the dirt and trim around and make it nice and neat and trim around the flower beds and get all the old debris out of the shrubbery and things. That was my job for 10 cents an hour. So you'd Pretty work about work. two hours after school and you made 20 cents. <laughs> Mowed the grass, it took a little better than an hour to do that, the old hand type mowers. So you made another maybe 20 cents and that's what you lived on. That's all the money you had. But then you could buy a Coke or a double cola, which was a forerunner of Pepsi. Things like that for a nickel. Did your family have a garden? Oh, yes. It was located on Washington Street, right, if anyone's familiar, where Mel Hafe lives now. And there was a streetcar track right alongside of it for the OPS streetcar that run from Marblehead to Toledo and back to Marblehead, and they'd done that all day long. It was probably, oh... 150 foot long the garden was and maybe 30 foot wide. Had peas, string beans, lima beans, tomatoes. What else? Never had sweet corn. Mm -hmm. 
onions, lettuce, had lettuce, cabbage, everything like that. My mother would, she would uh, process them cold packing, I think they called it at that time. You'd have to shell the peas, and cut the beans in maybe an inch and a half pieces, then they done something to them, put them in cans, and that's what you ate all winter long. But that garden took a lot of hoeing and a lot of picking of the beans and tomatoes, made their own tomato juice. Everybody was very busy in the summer, late summer, getting things canned. Uh, you mentioned the trolley line. Did you take the trolley? Oh, the yes. That, like I said, it ran from Marblehead in Ohio to Toledo and then back again. We would catch the streetcar, was the OPS, Ohio Public Service, at 10th and Washington. That's where the tracks run, and they run then out north to Route 51 and bear it off towards Toledo up until where the Edison substation is now on Route 51, which is a good mile uh, towards Salida from uh, Genoa Clay Center Road. And then it bared off to the right, go north through Clay Center, uh, Curtis, and a little town up by Toledo named of Booth, and then on into Toledo. And then when you got, they left you off at the main in urban station in Toledo, which is at, I think it was Jackson and Superior, I believe. And then that's where you also caught the, the trolley to come back home. And then they'd leave you off right where you got on at. And many times, especially during Christmas time, why you'd always go in Toledo every Saturday, it seemed like. To, to do your shopping? Yes. Tinkies, Lion's Door, LaSalle Cooks, Woolworths, Kresge's. Uh, I think that's about all of them that I can remember. Then, uh, of course, there was a, a streetcar track down through Main Street, too. That was Lakeshore Electric. Didn't ride that too much. Did, did you the, ever go the other way towards, away well, from Well, I did uh, on Lakeshore Electric, yes. Mm -hmm. We rode to Cleveland several times. A group of us young boys, we had enough money to buy a ticket to Cleveland and then go to the ball game in Cleveland. Once you got in Cleveland, then you still had to ride the Cleveland streetcar line out to the ballpark, which at that time was a league park. And after the game was over, the, the cars were sitting there waiting for you to take you back to your station in downtown Cleveland where you got the Lakeshore Electric uh, streetcar again. They brought you home. About how long a ride was it from oh, probably, here to uh, Cleveland? Two and a half hours, probably. So you could have it a went long through, ride home in the evening. Through Woodville, uh, Premont, Clyde, Bellevue, Monroeville, on into Cleveland that way, Norwalk. <clears throat> Let's talk about school. Okay. Where did you begin school? Which building? I started at the, what is now the Camper Building. So located on uh, Main Street and 4th Street, which is Route 163. Went six years there through the sixth grade. Uh, let, let's see. I started in 1929, I think, the fall of 1929. Oh, I went six years there. And then from there, the seventh and eighth grade was put into the what was in the high school. And <clears throat> let's see. Those were the only two buildings yes. at that time. Uh, <clears throat> then the went uh, junior high, seventh and eighth there at the was the high school, and then we went into high school right after the eighth grade, of course, and then graduated from that building on May twenty fifth, nineteen forty one. And from there, right into the service problem. Well, I went to work in oh. Columbus first mm -hmm. at an aircraft plant in Columbus, Ohio, Curtis Wright Corporation. I worked there from uh, uh, late November 1941, shortly before Pearl Harbor, until 
I was taken into the military, the Air Force, in uh, January, I think, 18th or so of 1943. And I worked at that plant then from November of 41 until I was taken into the service in January 43. Great job. You were assembling? Yes. We, uh, the line I was on, we built the wings, what they called the center section of the wings. It was not only part of the wing, but it was also the, part of the fuel tank. It was very uh, exacting work. You didn't want a leak of aviation fuel dripping around you. It's very explosive and very flammable. When you went into the service, um, where were you sent for? Where was your? We station? left from Columbus by train, went to Cincinnati, to Fort Thomas, K Kentucky, which is just right across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. And I'll never forget. I've told my wife a hundred times. <laughs> the first word I heard as we got off the bus it says, "You'll be sorry." <laughs> I never was sorry though. Honest, I really wasn't. I had a great job. I don't know how I deserved all that great, great work, but. What was your job in the Air Force? I was in the weather squadron. Oh. We plotted uh, what they call synopsis maps for the whole uh, United States, South America, Mexico, up along the west coast of Europe, out into Hawaii, so the planes could. Uh, know the weather ahead. I was uh, originally stationed, I went to, I should back up a little, I went to basic training in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. That's where they got you in condition. I was there, I think, eight weeks, nine weeks. Went to uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan to the Air Force Weather School there. And then from there, we got a furlough in route furlough, as they called it. And then I reported to uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And from there, we went overseas. And I went to the island of Trinidad first, which is just off the north coast of South America. I was there from uh, about July the 7th or 8th of 43 until November of 44. And then I was transferred from there to Puerto Rico, a big, huge air base there. And uh, the purpose of that was they were training the pilots and crews for their attack on Japan. We had uh, B-29 stationed there, and that's what they trained on. And I was stationed there from uh, then in November of 44 till I was discharged uh, day after Thanksgiving, 1945. And that Puerto Rico, I've often told my wife, that's the greatest place in the world to live. <laughs> Perfect weather. <laughs> Something like Hawaii. <laughs> Couldn't ask for Only better. a little closer. <laughs> yeah, a lot closer than Hawaii. Okay, well, I got a sidetracked there. I wanted to find out some more about school. Okay. What was high school and going to high school in Genoa like? Well... To me, it was very good, enjoyable, because then we got to play sports, football, basketball, and at that time, we only had boys track. And the girls started with uh, basketball, but then in 19, the start of basketball season in 1937, I think it was, the state outlawed girls basketball, so they couldn't play. So then we had Instead of having a girls' game and a boys' game at the varsity level, then we had a what they call the JV boys, and then the varsity boys played. And that was really wonderful because we had a chance to play uh, varsity basketball, which, of course, we did, I didn't play varsity until my sophomore year. But everybody looked forward to playing football, basketball. John Roberts was the coach, the trainer, the 
<clears throat> ankle wrap guy. Uh, he took care of all the bumps and bruises. And you know, nowadays they got a head coach and two or three assistant coaches and the doctors there with them. And we didn't have all that luxury. We just had one man. He done a wonderful job, and he not only was a coach, but he was also the, a teacher in science and uh, physics. And that is that who the middle school is named after? Yes. Later on, then, well, he later school. on then became uh, superintendent of the school general school district. He was also a principal and uh, superintendent, and then uh, so that's why they named that building after John C. Roberts. Did yeah. you participate in all of the sports? I participated in football four years, basketball four years, but I didn't ever participate in track. And with your love of baseball, they didn't we have didn't a, base, have a team, no. baseball team. We <laughs> had, uh, in baseball though, we had uh, the Waterworks Park, the bit, or the diamond is still there. And uh, we round up the gang and the guys that wanted to play, we go over there and just have a pickup game as they called it then, you know, split up the players even, maybe five, six, seven on a side, you never knew. However many showed up, you divided it about as equal as you could and just had a big time over there playing. Was there in the late 30s um, a Genoa basketball team that went to the state tournament? 1938, yeah. 1938. I was a freshman that year. Oh, you were a freshman. Yeah. In fact, uh, we were on the JVs and we scrimmaged them guys every night in practice. So we got good training just watching those fellows and playing against them. So by the time we got to be seniors, we had a pretty good ball team. We need to change our tape here. I didn't realize we'd been talking so long. <laughs> We've used up that tape already. Now, when you had summer break, what was there to do? What fun things? Well, we uh, swam a lot every day because it was free. Didn't charge anything and at that time. And then later on, the Methodist Church uh, took responsibility of the swimming facilities at the present swimming uh, quarry. And they helped develop it uh, to what it is today. Uh, it didn't cost you anything to swim. You could swim all day if you wanted to. But then uh, during the summer, as the uh, sun stayed up longer, you could swim after supper too, till it got dusk. And then they wanted everybody out, which you can understand. And then I mentioned before about the Henry Bergman making these concrete blocks and storing them out in the yard to cure. Well, they left passageways through those blocks so they could get to them once they dried. And that would be your dressing room. <laughs> you go change out of your street clothes into your swimming trunks and go for a swim. And then when you got done, why well, you come back and change into your street clothes. But you were hid from everybody. It was all buried back in under them uh, cement blocks. And uh, about every year through the summer, or yeah, during the summer, I should say, they had a Genoa Day over there. And they had swimming contests, uh, who could swim out to the raft and back in the shortest amount of time. And then someplace along the line, they made a, a big high tower where you could dive off or jump off the tower. And it was probably 30, 35 feet high. And you went up a wooden ladder straight up to get to the top uh, deck. And then that wasn't quite high enough for some of them. They had a railing around it where then somebody uh, would nail a big piece of board on the railing that you could stand on and then you could dive or jump off of that railing which made it all the more thrilling for them. I was never that brave. I couldn't do that. But I remember a young boy, he's dead now, Bob Race. They called him Buck Race. He was great for getting up on that railing and diving off of that thing. He was pretty good. He was just a little shafer then. And 
They had a big raft that was out in the anchored out, oh, maybe 50, 60 foot from shore. It basically stayed in one spot. It would turn, but it wouldn't move any place. And there was a small diving tower on that too. And they drove off of that into the quarry. And in one end of the raft, which was probably 15, no, more than that, 25 feet long by probably 12 foot wide, there was a big uh, square hole where they would jump off this tower that was located on the raft into this hole, which is now as you look back was kind of dumb because you never knew when somebody was going to swim up and come up there. And then during the Genoa days, uh, I can remember this very plainly, Iker Dunn, Claire Dunn, who was an old time resident of Genoa, uh, he held the record for swimming underwater the furthest. They dive in, everybody dive in, and then go as far as you could go. Why well, he'd he'd more than double what the majority of them could do. He'd probably go seventy five yards or so, which is quite a ways underwater. Of course, he if you knew him, he was a big muscular guy and big chest. He could hold a lot of air in his lungs, I guess. And, and then uh, another man, his son still lives here, John Werner. And John, in his uh, working days, he was on the, a mail sorter on the railroad that went through Genoa. He'd catch a train in Genoa and go to Cleveland, sort the mail on the way, turn around and that train or get on a different train and would come back to Genoa then later in the evening and they'd get more mail and they'd sort that mail on the way back and he'd get off of Genoa and go to his home. But he was a great swimmer and those Genoa days he'd swim either around the quarry or across and back on the quarry a couple times. He was a great, great swimmer and his son John, we call him Jack, He's a swimmer too. He's just like his dad was. And he's been a lifetime resident of Genoa too. I think he was born in the house where his dad and mother lived. And he's got a lot of tales to tell too. And then uh, every summer the swimming quarry, late August, mid-August, would turn milky white. And it lasts that way for Oh, I'd say maybe two weeks. And then gradually it would clear up again and the white would be gone. You'd have nice clear water again. Do you and think everybody it was limestone? Off, or yeah, it used to be a limestone or? quarry. And I must have been enough lime in there. I had a reaction some enough way to the sunlight or the temperature of the water, whatever it was. And every year that would get real milky and... That kind of stopped the swimming for a while because you couldn't see where you're going or anything. The Genoa homecoming is a pretty big celebration yes. in town. Was mm -hmm. that separate from Genoa days? Or? Yes. Yeah, that came after uh, after World War II. I think they had their first one in, I don't know if it was 46 or 47. I hear right here on Main Street. You know, they took up the from 6th Street to 8th Street is where it was held. All the little booths and carnival atmosphere was there where the business part of town is. You know, they held that every August for years and years. And then eventually they kind of outgrew the downtown and they moved it over on the quarry bank where it's held uh, as of today. Did you ever go out to Forest Park? Oh, yeah, yeah. We used to walk out there, out the railroad track to to uh, Riemann Road, unless you was lucky enough to know somebody was going to drive out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could squeeze a <laughs> ride in. Yeah, and then you get to Riemann Road and walk up to to uh, Woodville Road, and that's where Forest Park was. Oh, they had a skating rink, uh, slot machines every place, slot penny machines. ones, nickels, dimes. That's about as high as they went, dime, I guess. Dance floor, uh, speedway, roller coaster, uh, Ferris wheel, 
uh, what are they, Merry Ground, and a lot of other small rides for the kids, younger kids. So of course, we were big wheels and we thought we could do anything. <laughs> uh, then, in the summertime, uh, not every week, event, on certain weekends, they'd have a, like a high trapeze act come in. And they'd uh, put a, a big ladder affair up it and uh, put cables on it to steady it so it wouldn't fall and stand real rigid. And I suppose that was 50, 60 foot high. It was, to me, quite high. And then these guys and women, young girls, would get up there on this platform and dive into a a big tub of water, probably 10 foot in diameter possibly, and about four foot deep. That's what they'd jump into or dive into. That would draw the people from every place. It would be nothing to have probably six, 700 people out there. Just to view that and to spend their money any other way they wanted to. But that was quite a active place when it's in the heyday. That was before World War II. And after World War II, well, then it just faded away. That was the end of it then. The last thing standing, I think, was the roller rink, roller skating rink. And my wife used to tell, or tells me how often she went over there Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, skating. And it, a lot of other people had done the same thing. It was a very, very active place. Yeah. I heard they had a marble dance floor. Yes, yeah. And uh, and then there was tables around the uh, circumference or the perimeter of the dance floor, and the one part had a bandstand at where the band could get. And then later on, in, <clears throat> I think it was after World War II, I'm pretty sure it was, it became a gambling casino for a while. I don't know how long, but they did gamble in there. Gamblers out of Detroit and Cleveland and wherever else would come and <laughs> have their fun there. I never got involved in that, though. <laughs> did your wife grow up in Genoa, too? Pretty well. She's, uh, grew, she was born on uh, just outside of Ottawa County on Fostoria Road, but in Wood County, Lake Township. And she went to uh, Lake, graduated from Lake high school. But her dad and mother always came to Genoa to do the shopping. And then she'd tag along or they wouldn't leave her home alone, so she had to come with them. So how did you meet your wife? Blind date. Blind date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was working in Columbus at the time and the fellow I was working with, his name was, uh, they called him Jake, Jake Coleman. His right name was Charles Coleman. He and I uh, we didn't work in the same department at Curtis Gray, but we were good buddies. We'd played football together and everything in Genoa. And he was going with a girl that was real good friends with my, with Nervy. And they got us together, and we've been together ever since. 60 years. <laughs> Wasn't too bad a choice, I guess. Were you married before you went off to no. work? No. I was... After you, yeah. came, you got married when you returned? I was discharged in... Uh, August or uh, November 45, and we married uh, August 10th, 1946. So after you were discharged, did you return to Genoa? Then? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my dad had a, a trucking business then. He, uh, as the war came on, he got into hauling uh, with tank trucks uh, petroleum to the different uh, people for Shell Oil Company, a Gulf Oil Company, and City Service Oil Company, and John Stevens here in Genoa. Uh, they hauled all over the state of Ohio, and I got a, when I got out of the service, why well, they were really busy, so I went to work for my dad at that time, hauling petroleum for nine years, and then I went into the dispatch end of it, and. Uh, and the repair and maintenance of the units after I got done driving. So he gave me my first job after I got out of the service. 
Of course, he was glad to have somebody help him because he was doing it all alone before. So he needed help and I was available and I liked that kind of work, so that's where I went. Was your father Hobby Bauer? Yes. Okay, I've heard that name yeah. around town. He has a street light up here uh, by Main and Sixth. Uh, uh, there's a plaque on the ground that uh, my brother and I bought to put on there. Yeah, he was very active here in Genoa. He was on the council for a few years, Board of, board of Public Affairs for many years, and done a lot of work free gratis and so on that most people don't remember. What was his first name? Harold. Harold. Yep. But everybody called him Hobby. Hobby, yeah. And I, in fact, I got that nickname too. Oh. Yeah. So you decided to stay in Genoa to raise your family? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was that like to, Razor. what was there for a young family to do in Genoa? Well, not more than we had when we were their age, but as uh, time went on, why, uh, we got a theater here. Uh, of course, they lost a roller skating rink. It burnt down shortly after World War II. And... They had no bowling alleys until this John Werner I was telling you about that could swim around the quarry and that. He and this Mac McClargan uh, established bowling alleys at Forest Park, but they was on the east side of the road. And then that kind of became popular for bowling. But the, of course our kids were a little bit too young to enjoy that. Uh, they didn't have a whole lot to do, really. Well, then Little League Baseball started, and there were Girl Scouts, and uh, what was the forerunner of the Girl Scouts? Uh, brownies, brownies, is it? Brownies, and the Boy Scouts. They, the kids were all in that. Our kids were. We have three, two boys and a girl. Was there much going on at the park besides a quarry? Uh... No, I don't, not that I know of. And the two of them learned to swim. The two boys learned to swim, but our daughter, she never could make it <laughs> for some reason. Clubs seem to be a big part of uh, social life in Genoa. Did you belong to any of the clubs that were in there? I didn't know. My wife has, so she's belonged to... Tresetta Club. Oh. What, what was that one? Tresetta. Tresetta. I never heard of that one. I think it's still active. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, when we were young parents, then we took up the bowling. We started bowling uh, one night a week. You had to get away from your kids some way, yeah. you know. You couldn't stand them all day long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she bowled on... Thursday night, I think I bowled on Monday night. And the alleys were there, were uh, right next to Blasey's at that time. What is now the Hourglass, just north of that, that first building. And then they went out of business for some reason. I don't know why anymore. So then we ended up at uh, Wood or Elmore Bowling. And then also we had, went to Fremont and bowled for two years. And then I finished bowling at the Clay Center, Rec Center. Did you work at the trucking firm until you retired? No. Well, yes. I See, I started there in 1940, wait, no, 46, yeah, 1946. And worked there until 1980. And then the trucking company dissolved itself because of lack of business. They had no, nothing to haul. And the reason for that was uh, anybody in the business at that time, we had to contend with what they called deregulation. And that just hurt everybody badly. And at this day right now, there's not one in that business that was in it when we were in it. Uh, then I went, as I left the trucking company in uh, 1980, 
I got a job with the old the school where I graduated from as custodian, and I worked there for six years. Then, then I retired from there. Well, this has been really interesting to hear about um, growing up in Genoa, and thank you so much for. Well, thank you for in. asking me. I've, maybe I can do some more sometime for you. Okay, that would be that would be wonderful. I didn't ask you about your father's business. Well, he, he came here to Genoa from Fremont, Ohio, in about 1924 or so, 25 possibly, as a dump truck operator. He had one dump truck, and he bought a snow plow for that and helped the, or the township plow the roads in the wintertime, plow the snow off. And then he advanced from that to uh, two more dump trucks, which gave him three. And he worked those trucks for the U.S. Gypsum Company doing what they call stripping the dirt off the top of the limestone. And they helped build, at that time, was supposed to be the Catholic Church Cemetery. It's just south of town, just as you exit Genoa. There's a big, huge mound of dirt there on your west side of the road. And it's, I helped do some of that. And that's how he got his trucks going. And then in 19, uh, get my ears straightened out here, <clears throat> about 1936 or so, he got a contract with John Stevens Oil Company to haul his petroleum from Finley, Ohio, back to Genoa. He made about three trips a, a week doing that. And I would go with him on a Saturday a lot of times. So I was only like 14 years old, maybe. And we go to Finley up through on 105 State Route, up through Pemberville and work our way over to Bowling Green, then to Finley on Route 25. And he'd load down there of kerosene or whatever the load happened to be. And we'd drive it back to Genoa and he'd pump it into John Stevens storage tanks. <clears throat> and he had one truck, a dump truck, that he utilized for the what they call the tractor, that's to pull the semi, because that particular truck had air brakes on it, and the trailer had air brakes, so you needed to be compatible. And that's what he used. It had a four-cylinder engine in it, a wooden cab with no glass. The only glass he had was a windshield and the rest of it was all leather and canvas curtains with small icing glass windows in it to see out of. No heater and of course the busiest time of the year is in the winter when you're hauling fuel oil and it's usually the coldest then so he went many a trip to Finley without a heater. <laughs> and then that gradually built up and he was able to uh, get a different tractor, but he had the same trailer. And I'll never forget this one. It was a, what they call six compartments, six different individual tanks on this one big trailer. Held 3,640 gallon. And when he got to Finley, they'd load him through a, a line that was an inch in diameter. Well, that took about two and a half hours to load that much product at that time. And then he was able to get a different tractor, a little more powerful tractor, and he could go a little faster. And so that's how he started. And then when the war came on, World War II, then the oil companies were looking for people to transport their products. So he caught on with Shell Oil, Gulf Oil, City Service, and John Stevens. And he was transporting aviation fuel, uh, general... Uh, automobile fuel and, and uh, fuel oil for house heating and so on. And that's how he developed his business, which it, in the end, when he had to quit, or at the busiest time, which would have been about uh, from 1959 through about 1970, they had 19 units running. So he had grown that much. And the reason uh, 
where the cutback was when the oil embargo started uh, with Iraq and Saudi Arabia in 1972. Well, all the oil companies got very particular on who they sold their product to. They wanted to go where they could make the most profit. Well, the most profit, profitable one that cut us, cut him out of about half his work. So there set the trucks and tankers with nothing to do. And it went downhill from there, let's say. But at one time he had 19 units running. There was uh, uh, two in Lima, Ohio, that was for Shell Oil, one in Columbus for Shell Oil, one in Cleveland for Shell Oil, and the rest of them are all out of Genoa for Gulf Oil, Shell Oil, City Service, and John Stevens. He done really good at it. Did Marvin work? Outside the home? Well, after the kids were raised and pretty well on their own, she got a job at this uh, old high school also in the dishwasher at the cafeteria. They called her the meanest <laughs> dishwasher they ever had. <laughs> no, she done a fine job. Because <laughs> she wouldn't let the kids get away with some of the antics they would like to try to do, which is the way it should be. You still had discipline back then, but you don't anymore. Well, thank you again. Okay, I'm glad I could help you. I am too. I've enjoyed talking to you.